shows us that brilliance often goes hand in hand with madness. And nowhere is that connection more visible than in the turbulent world of rock and roll. Musical geniuses have literally lost their minds to drugs and the specter of mental illness. The most infamous madman of them all was Beach Boy Brian Wilson, who didn't leave his house for nearly a decade and actually stayed in bed for four years straight. He even built a huge sandbox in the middle of his living room. Brian Wilson may be the poster child of the mad genius, but other cutting-edge artists from the 60s descended to even darker depths. Grammy winner Jim Gordon, Skip Spence of the band Moby Grape, and Pink Floyd founder and guitarist Sid Barrett. Emily tries, but misunderstands. Barrett helped pioneer the psychedelic sounds of the 60s. Joe Boyd, who produced the band's first album, remembers Barrett's magnetic personality. Sid was the spark plug of Pink Floyd. He was very charismatic, handsome, and he seemed to be the center of the group. And he wrote all the songs, he sang, played the guitar. But this innovative musician may have fallen victim to his own psychedelic inspirations. And I remember running into his girlfriend at the time, and she said he's been tripping for four days or something like that. And he took way more acid than anybody ever should, really. And it blew some circuits. Living in a drug haze, Barrett's bizarre onstage antics became legendary. He would often smash tablets of the sedative Mandrax into his hair before shows, then rejoice as they melted down his face on stage. Other times, the talented guitarist simply forgot where he was. A lot of the songs, Sid would just stop playing. He would start the song, and then he would just drop his hands at his side and stand there on stage with his guitar on, and he would come, to come back to the verse for him to sing he wouldn't sing. In fits of paranoia, Barrett would refuse huge royalty checks, give away his guitars, and even worked as a gravedigger. For Boyd, it was difficult to watch the man who started Pink Floyd self-destruct. And the thing that I'll never forget is that as Sid came by, I looked and I said, hi Sid. And it was like some in the three months or two and a half months since I'd seen him. Someone had come along and gone and just turned the light off. The spark in his eye had just gone out. The pressure to perform became too much and Pink Floyd lost its most influential member when Sid Barrett suffered a massive mental breakdown. The impact of that loss reverberates through some of Pink Floyd's most powerful albums. Many songs on Dark Side of the Moon, Wish You Were Here, and The Wall are tributes to Sid's genius and friendship. Even one of the most famous secret tracks or backward tracks on The Wall on Empty Spaces, you hear Roger Waters say, congratulations, you just discovered the secret message. Please send your answer in care of old Pink, the funny farm. And the reference to the funny farm was the idea that Barrett had had a breakdown and that he left the band. In the early 1970s, Sid's friends and bandmates tried to help him out of his malaise. He recorded two solo albums, Barrett and the aptly titled Madcap Laughs. Neither record sold. Sadly, for the past three decades, the musical madman behind one of rock's most inventive bands has lived his life in a metal haze, moving in and out of various institutions. Sid is being looked after somewhere in England and not very well. While the madcap may be just a shell of his former self, his musical legacy sadly hints at what could have been a long and brilliant career.
But the casualties of 60s psychedelia didn't stop with Sid Barrett. As music journalist Douglas Wolk tells us, Skip Spence was an innovative musician with seemingly unlimited talent. Skip Spence was a magnificent songwriter, incredibly imaginative, inc incredibly charismatic. He also walked a fine line between genius and madness. Spence played with influential San Francisco bands like Quicksilver Messenger Service and the legendary Jefferson Airplane. But he believed it would be his band, Moby Grape, that would carry him to greatness. Moby Grape were the great big hype. They were supposed to be the next big thing. But drugs and a formidable temper came between Spence and his dream of rock and roll stardom. One night, a bad LSD trip and a fight with a local drummer turned into an unforgettable episode of violence. He showed up at the drummer's hotel room and chopped the door in with an ax didn't find the drummer inside, went to the recording studio in a cab, still carrying the axe in his pajamas. Luckily, the authorities got a hold of Skip before he found the drummer. Well, of course, after he busted his drummer's door down with an axe, he got taken off to the mental hospital. He was institutionalized for about six months. After his release, Skip Spence struggled once again to find the music among the madness. Hoping to start a new life, he left San Francisco for Nashville where he recorded his first solo album. You can hear his mind disintegrating as he's making this record. The album starts out with beautiful, gorgeously crafted pop songs, and then gradually turns into just sort of whacking on drums and playing a little bass and mumbling stuff every once in a while. The album was a complete bust. For Spence, the disappointment was crushing. As the years went by, Spence fought for his mental health, but drugs got in the way. His addiction even led him right up to death's door. There was a time in the 70s where Skip Spence had a drug overdose and was declared dead and taken to the hospital in the morgue, and they put a tow tag on him, and then he sat up and asked for a glass of water. Died, resurrected. Spence was hoping for another kind of resurrection when he was asked to record a song for the recent X-Files movie. So some hip music producer from the X-Files decided, who's weirder than Skip Spence? Who's got a stranger story behind them than Skip Spence? So they tracked Skip Spence down, and they got him to record this song called, I believe, Land Beyond the Sun. Terrifying song. And there's this voice that sounds ravaged by time, incredibly charismatic, but just torn apart, falling apart, talking about the land beyond the sun. I will be by your side here in the land of the sun. The producer said, oh, we can't put this on. It's just too scary. His hopes for a musical rebirth once again dashed. Skip Spence lost his final battle in 1999. He died of lung cancer at the age of 53. But perhaps the most terrifying tale of madness belongs to Jim Gordon. His mental collapse wouldn't just take its toll on one band, it would touch some of the world's most respected musicians. Jim Gordon was one of the most popular sessions drummers in the late 60s and early 70s, and his career had, had spanned many artists, and he recorded with uh, Joe Cocker and Leon Russell with the Mad Dogs and Englishman tour. Gordon could play nearly every instrument and was in fact the most successful studio drummer of his time. But as fellow drummer Jamie Oldacre tells us, Jim's most creative contribution to the rock world would come from the keyboard of a piano. Jim Gordon wrote the piano part on the end of Layla. It's his most famous thing. <laughs> Very famous for that, which is a great part, by the way. Outside, he seemed to have it all, but inside, he was a tortured soul who couldn't stop the strange voices in his head. 
Jim Gordon was diagnosed with uh, paranoid schizophrenia, the voice that he internalized was the voice of his mother. And he believed that his mother was withholding food from him, that his mother had uh, withheld his desire to play the drums. Jim was playing with legendary blues guitarist Eric Clapton when his schizophrenia became so debilitating he could no longer function. Jamie Oldacre was called in to replace him. He was one of those kind of personalities where he's like, you probably met people like, they're like really nice, but they're like inside or like, you're gonna like blow up someday, you know? And explode, he did. Jim began hiding in hotel rooms, trying to get away from the voices, but he couldn't run from what was inside. And the delusions were so powerful, they turned this amazing musician into a murderer. Tragically, he took a hammer and he killed his mother. He was convicted of second degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. And in a bizarre twist of fate, that's when he was honored with music's most sought after award. While he was in this incarceration, the slow version of Layla was released by Eric Clapton and, and uh, Jim Gordon wins a Grammy. In the end, Jim Gordon's madness was controlled with medication, but he continues to live his life behind bars, paying the price for his terrifying crime. Jim Gordon, Skip Spence, and Sid Barrett. Three promising lives, three brilliant musicians, one common and tragic theme. They couldn't contain their genius, and eventually it shattered their sanity. Ladies and gentlemen, from Los Angeles, California, the door. He was the charismatic frontman of one of the 60s most popular bands, a heart.